Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. I know your bulletin says Isaiah. I sent that in. That's what I intended to preach this morning. But uh, that message went back in the oven, and uh, it will be coming out soon. Pastor Gabe, don't touch Isaiah 6, buddy. You got 65 other books, all right? And like 65 other chapters in Isaiah. Just, all right, we good with that? All right. Hey, I'm just being serious, okay? All right. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4. We're going to look today at verses 35 through 41. Join with me as I read. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? How many of you are looking forward to heaven this morning? Say amen. 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 Randy Alcorn was at the Shepherds Conference at Grace Community Church a few years back, spoke on heaven. He has a book entitled Heaven, which I would recommend to you. It's a book I know that has been a blessing recently to Pastor Leek and Sue. I have a friend on the Navy basketball team that um, I'm able to meet with weekly. His name is Cameron Davis. I baptized him here over a year ago. I, I get to meet with him weekly for discipleship. And we are currently reading through the book of Romans together. And I've watched him grow tremendously in his faith these last two years. And we've had some really good times together uh, in the word and in prayer and in fellowship with each other. And there have been a couple of times in the last few weeks where Cameron has said to me, either just told me in person or told me by text, today would be a good day to go to heaven. And I say, amen. It would be. What are you most looking forward to in going to heaven and being with the Lord? I'm going to give you some choices here. No more work. No more looking for work. No more updating your resume. No more homework, papers, quizzes, exams, and finals. I work with college students, so no more bills. No more pain, no more suffering, no more sadness and tears, no more being tired, and no more sin. All those are negative. Here's some positive things about heaven. It's forever. There's no end. Think about that for a minute. Don't think too long or your head will hurt, but (laughs) everything that we know in life has an end, right? We will never be in heaven and go, only 30 more days, right? It's forever. It is eternal, no less days to sing God's praise. Streets of gold. This is one of my favorite things to think about, uninterrupted worship. Meeting new people, being reacquainted with loved ones, friends and family who have gone before us. and seeing Jesus for the very first time. It will be so wonderful to see our Savior face to face, won't it? To talk with him, to praise and worship him, to do what we saw as we read through Revelation 4, and to know him like never before. And I always ask the question, what would it have been like to have met Jesus while he was on the earth? Well, it would have been an experience like no other. To meet a man like no other man in the world, completely different, absolutely unique. 
For Jesus was a, a perfect man. He was a righteous man, a holy man, a sinless man. And he was the God man, fully God, fully man. And this was the experience of anyone who ever met Jesus while he was alive. That's what they encountered. Think about Jesus when he was 12 years old, when he was left behind by his parents in the temple. And when they found him, they found him listening to the teachers and asking them questions. And we read in Luke 2.47 that all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. In the Sermon on the Mount that is contained in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7, when you read that great sermon, and then in 728 it says, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. When you look at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus is in Nazareth, and he comes to the synagogue, and he stands up to read from the prophet Isaiah. And just from the reading of the passage, we read in Luke 420 that He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Two verses later, we read that all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. We see the testing from the religious elite, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, testing Jesus with questions, trying to trap him. And we see one coming to him and saying to him, what commandment is foremost of all? And Jesus and this man have a conversation that is included for us in the Gospel of Mark. And the scribe concludes at the end that to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then we read in Mark 12, 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And then after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. In the death of Jesus, the Roman centurion who was guarding him and observed his death when he died, we read in Mark 15, 39, that the centurion who was standing right in front of him, when he saw the way that he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. In the arrest of Jesus in John chapter 18, when they come to arrest him, Jesus is willing to give himself up and he says to those, to that cohort of soldiers, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said to them, I am. Those great Greek words, ego, a me, where he declared himself to be the God who was and the God who has always been and the God who will always be. The God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, the I am, the same God that sent Moses to the children of Israel. When Jesus said, I am, we read that the the Roman soldiers, the chief priests and the Pharisees drew back and fell to the ground. Why did they do this? Jesus had said, I am before. He had said, ego, a me before. In the Gospel of John, we have those seven I am, I am statements of Jesus. We have him saying, I am, to the woman at the well, to the Jews in John 8, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. Why did they fall to the ground? Because they were in the presence of God himself. And his glory knocked them to the ground. I always wonder, like, when they got back up and he said it again, whom do you seek? If they were, like, holding on to a buddy, you know, like, (laughs) it's going to happen again. His glory knocked them to the ground. They fell down because they were in the presence of a man like no other man they had ever met or had ever been around. They were in the presence of the Holy One of Israel. They were in the presence of God himself. So as we come to Mark 4... The disciples were following Jesus. They have heard him preach and teach. They have recently heard him preach the greatest sermon ever, the Sermon on the Mount, again found in Matthew 5 to 7. They have seen him do great signs and wonders. They have heard him teach in parables like no one they had ever heard. And now they they prepare to depart with him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they have no idea 
what is about to take place. Jesus did. And I wonder if he smiled at the thought of what was about to happen. Nothing could have prepared them for such an event. Their lives would never be the same after this moment. They would quickly realize that the man in the boat with them was like no other man they had ever met. When we read this account in Matthew's gospel, we see that Jesus had tried to leave for the other side of the sea, but he was stopped by two men before he departed. In Matthew 8, verses 19 to 21, we read that a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and allow the dead to bury their dead. Now Jesus is about to depart with his disciples. We can assume that those men did not come with him. There is no mention of them again in the text. So two points this morning. And the first thing I want you to see here in the word is the disciples' fear of the storm. The disciples' fear of the storm. Jesus gets in the boat. It is a fishing boat. His disciples get in the boat with him and they began to sail to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. If you know about the Sea of Galilee, it's about 13 miles long, 8 miles wide. It's 165 feet deep. It is situated 700 feet below sea level, making it the lowest body of sweet water on the earth. Look at verse 37. We read that there arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. The Sea of Galilee was very unpredictable. It was known for its sudden and its violent storms, and that is exactly what is happening here. The sea was obviously peaceful when they first got into the boats, or else they would have waited to sail later. R.C. Sproul says, The Sea of Galilee is like an enchanting woman whose moods are fiercely changeable. Every sailor in the region is warned of the fickleness of this body of water. Because of its peculiar location in the mountains between the Mediterranean Sea and the desert, the lake is exposed to strange quirks of nature. Violent winds can come across its surface as if blowing through a funnel. These winds come without warning and can turn the tranquil lake into a roaring tempest in a matter of seconds. Even with today's modern equipment, there are those in Palestine who refuse to sail on the Sea of Galilee for fear of perishing under the wrath of her violent moods. D. Edmund Heber, a great Bible commentator, says, Such sudden, furious storms of hurricane proportions were characteristic of the lake, which lies 682 feet below sea level. These storms often swept down on the sea through the deep gaps in the highlands surrounding the lake. The deep ravines served as gigantic funnels to draw the wind down upon the waters. And for a boat to capsize in such a storm meant sure death. This is really helpful information, especially as we examine what the disciples say to Jesus during this storm. It is a sudden and furious storm that Hebert references in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark that now faces Jesus and his disciples. Mark tells us that the the boat was already filling up with water. I love the King James how it reads. It says the waves beat into the ship. Matthew describes the boat being covered with waves. The waves were hurling themselves against the boat and were breaking into it. There should have been a sign on the side of the boat that said, you will get wet on this ride. But this is not Tidal Force at Hershey Park or Splash Mountain at Disney World, nor are Jesus and his disciples on a Disney cruise or on a carnival cruise ship. They are on a small fishing boat. And so Jesus just tells the disciples before the storm hits, I have everything under control. Just relax and enjoy the ride, right? No, not so much. Verse 38, we see that Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Asleep on the cushion. Some translations say a pillow. This is amazing because this was before Mike Lindell invented my pillow. (laughs) 
Jesus found a pillow so comfortable that he was able to sleep in a furious storm. I have a friend named Jason Hummerkaus. He was our pastor's son at our church in Illinois. He's a year younger than me. Jason can fall asleep anytime, anywhere, any place. It's a real talent that he has. And I have witnessed this firsthand on numerous occasions. I used to uh, be a, a staff pastor at a church in Illinois, and I lived in a church house, a parsonage. Back then, they were kind of popular, and our pastor and his family lived just across the grass. And so Jason would come to my house because I had cable, and uh, he would just kind of invite himself over to watch NBA games. No matter what I was doing, he just kind of showed up, which was fine. He was a friend, and uh, would fall asleep in my recliner. Uh, <laughs> And I would really want to go to bed, and he was just there. And, and then he would wake up and look at me and then go back to sleep. And so, <laughs> but I remember we went to a, an Illinois football game one time, Illinois, Michigan, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, August of 19, uh, 1996, in the big house. 105,000 people were at that game. And Jason was tired, but I was like, there's no way he could fall asleep in these circumstances. But yes, he did. And I thought about that as, as you look at this picture of this, this passage and this story, this small fishing boat was being tossed to and fro. The boat was already filling up with water. The disciples knew the boat was beginning to sink. Their chances of survival are very slim, but Jesus was sleeping. You know, the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would be God. The Gospels reveal that Jesus is God. Christ himself claimed that he was God. The apostles taught that Jesus was God. The epistles teach that Jesus was God. But this historic event illustrates that fact. Proof that he was God, that he is holy, that he is completely separate from man. Both Matthew and Mark tell us that Jesus was asleep. Matthew witnessed it himself. Mark would have learned this from Peter. And I think what's going on here, the gospel writers are telling us this to mark the contrast between Jesus, who is calm, and the disciples who are anxious. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him. D. Edmund Hebert, again, points out that several of the disciples were experienced fishermen, at least one third of them. We know Peter, Andrew, James, and John for sure. Men who had sailed the Sea of Galilee before, numerous times, men who were acquainted with such storms as this one. Yet in their extremity, by instinct, they turned to Jesus in the midst of the storm, who was not a fisherman, but a carpenter, but they turned to him to help them in this critical and desperate situation. I want you to really closely observe what they say to him here in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Matthew records Jesus saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Perish is in the present tense. We are perishing. We are dying. Not we may die. It's happening right now. The disciples saw themselves as already going down to destruction. After all, Jesus was asleep. They thought he did not care that they were dying. It is obvious why they said what they said, because they were afraid. They felt hopeless. They felt helpless. Their lives were in danger, and death to them was inevitable. Verse 39, and he got up. And rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. Jesus, who was perfectly calm as he always was, stands up and calms the raging sea. He rebuked the winds. He spoke to the sea, just a simple command, hush, be still. And the wind and the waves obeyed him. And you know what? They had to because he created them. The wind stopped suddenly. The waves ceased from crashing into and filling the boat with water. 
One more time from D. Edmund Hebert. He says, such raging winds were known to die down suddenly, but the sudden dying down of the dashing waves was most extraordinary. Jesus rebuked the wind. Jesus rebuked the waves. And then he rebuked his disciples. Verse 40. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? How had Jesus wanted them to respond to such a violent and fierce storm? Well, he would have wanted them to rest confidently in the will of the Father. What a lesson for us. Jesus knew this storm was coming. I would argue, and I think you would agree, that he ordained it. He could have prevented it. But instead, he would use it to teach his disciples that peace comes through faith. Jesus uses this great storm for a teaching time. This is Discipleship 101. They're in the classroom. And the teacher asks his students a question. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I think Jesus has the right to ask ask such a question. I don't think he's being too hard on the 12. This was not the first time the disciples had been with Jesus. In Matthew 4, verses 18 to 22, we see the the calling of Peter and Andrew and James and John. In verse 23 of Matthew 4, after they had begun to follow him, he was going throughout all Galilee, healing every kind of disease, healing every kind of sickness among the people. Matthew 4, 24 says that the news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. They saw him heal a man with leprosy. They witnessed him heal the centurion's servant from a great distance. Peter had seen Jesus heal his own mother-in-law. But during the great storm, they were completely afraid. They were fearing for their lives. They had little to no faith in God to spare them. And what happens next in the text is absolutely phenomenal. And here we see the disciples' fear of the Savior. The disciples' fear of the Savior. Back in verse 38, obviously, the disciples are afraid. They say to Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? Their fear is obvious. Verse 40, Jesus addresses them saying, why are you afraid? Here, Jesus saw their fear. It was evident that they were afraid. But look at what we see in verse 41. They became very much afraid. The New King James reads, they they feared exceedingly. Jesus had calmed the wind and the sea, but their hearts were now more anxious than they had ever been. Their heart rates actually increased after the storm was calmed. They were more afraid at this moment when the waves and the wind were perfectly calm than they were just minutes before when they thought they were about to drown. After the sea was calm, their fear increased because they saw something in their fishing boat that was more frightening than anything they had ever encountered in nature. Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychiatry, once espoused the theory that men invent religion out of a fear of nature. Perhaps you've studied this before. That man fears natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, and floods. Man fears disease and death. He does not know how to deal with these things, and so he invents a God who has power over earthquakes and floods, a God who has power over disease and even death. And this God is personal. We can talk to him. We can pray to him. We can plead to him to save us from disaster and disease and death. Man cannot plead with a hurricane. Man cannot bargain with cancer. Man cannot negotiate with a flood. And so he invents a God to help him deal with these frightening things, according to Freud. But listen to what R.C. Sproul says. What is significant about this story in Scripture is that the disciples' fear increased after the threat of the storm was removed. 
The storm made them afraid. Jesus' action to still the, to still the tempest made them even more afraid. In the power of Christ, they met something more frightening than they ever met in nature. They were in the presence of the holy. We wonder what Freud would have said about that. Why would men invent a God whose holiness was more terrifying than the forces of nature that provoked them to invent a God in the first place? We can understand, understand men inventing an unholy God, a God who brought only comfort. But why a God more scary than the earthquake, flood, or disease? It is one thing to fall victim to the flood or fall, to fall prey to cancer, but it is another thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, they were in, in the presence of the Holy One. And they became very much afraid. They feared exceedingly. They had a deep reverential awe in the presence of the supernatural. And in verse 41, they said to one another, who then is this? Translation, what have we signed up for? I think it's interesting that they said this to one another. They kept silent toward Jesus. They, they spoke about their feeling of awe only to each other. Even the Apostle, Paul, or Apostle Peter was silenced here. Another modern day miracle. <laughs> if you have a translation that says something like, who then is this? That is very literal. Matthew eight twenty seven. what kind of man is this? Who is this? The word man is not found in the Greek. In fact, when you look at this in Matthew's gospel, it, it could be that the former tax collector here is making a contrast because in Matthew eight twenty seven it says, the men were amazed and said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Again, the word man to describe Jesus is not there. Literally, it's who is this or what is this? In silence, they pondered Jesus' true identity, and they realized in this moment that they did not really know him. Who is this? The disciples are, are human, sinful men, and they are, they are searching for a category to put Jesus in, a type that they were all familiar with. We all do that. When we try to relate and connect with people, we can go, ah, that guy likes sports. I can talk to him about sports. That guy likes politics. I can talk to him about that. That guy likes cars and motorcycles. I can talk to them about that. This guy likes theology. I can spend hours with him. That guy doesn't like anything. I don't really know what to talk about with him. <laughs> but here the disciples found no category that was adequate to capture the person of Jesus. Because he is in a class all by himself. He is a cut above the rest. He was unlike anyone they had ever encountered. He is one of a kind, a complete foreigner to them. The disciples had met all kinds of men, tall men and short men, fat men and skinny men, smart men and dumb men, Greeks and Romans, Syrians and Egyptians, Samaritans and fellow Jews. But they had never met a holy man. They had never met a man who could simply speak to the wind and the waves and cause them to obey. Friends, the God and Christ that we serve is holy. He is other than us. He is separate from us. I've been so blessed in my life by the, the preaching, the writing of John Calvin. I've read so many of his sermons, his commentaries. I love the Institute's. And John Calvin says this, hence that dread and amazement with which, as Scripture uniformly relates, holy men were struck and overwhelmed whenever they beheld the presence of God. Men are never duly touched and impressed with a conviction of their significance until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. Well, how do you react how do I react to the storms in our lives? How great is your faith? 
Or maybe the better question would be, how weak is your faith? How weak is my faith? But I think the question that God would have us ask ourselves is is this. What does it mean to me that God is holy? If you have placed faith in Jesus Christ alone and your faith has produced genuine, it has proved to be genuine by producing fruit, a life of good works. The Bible gives you assurance in Romans 5.1 that being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those of you, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 38 to 39, nothing, absolutely nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Another man who is, who's blessed me by his preaching, he's now with the Lord, James Montgomery Boyce. He was at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, I think 25 or 26 years, really had the golden voice. If you've ever heard Boyce preach, amazing voice, amazing communicator. And near the end of his life, he he got cancer and was dying. And James Montgomery Boyce had written uh, a lot of modern day hymns, uh, many of them based on the book of Romans. And I had this little hymnal that he put together and, and we did a couple of those songs in our church in Indiana. And one of them was, about Romans 8, 38 to 39, what shall separate me? And it just, it just contained that whole passage. And, um, you know, the, the final line, it's all these questions, what shall separate me? And then at the end, it says nothing. Nothing will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And, and I, I was at a conference years ago in Ohio, and his music minister was there, and, and Boyce had gone to be with the Lord. And And so he was introducing one of these hymns that Boyce had written to us, and we were going to sing it. And he told this story how when Boyce was very sick, and he would go to see him, either at the hospital or at his home, and and Boyce could no longer speak. But when they got to that part of the song where it said nothing, Boyce would go like that. What a picture. If we are in Christ, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You can rest, you can be still, you can let your heart rate come down because the one who is holy has made you holy. He has covered you with his righteousness so that you can stand in the presence of a holy God and not be consumed. When we think about our sin, all the sins we have done, even just the ones that we know about, and when we think about what Jesus has forgiven us from, we should be able to exclaim in reverential awe, who is this that would forgive me of all my sin and grant to me eternal life? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such an amazing passage of Scripture as we get to see the holiness of Christ. Lord, we see him as the God-man, fully God, fully man, unlike anyone who has ever touched this earth before. He is holy. He is our sinless Savior. He is our substitute. He is God incarnate. And Lord, there was a time that we were far off from you, but you sent your Son. You sent your son who left the glory of heaven, who came to earth, who was born of a virgin, who grew up like us, who was tempted in every way that we are, but was without sin. We thank you for his perfect life, his obedience, the righteousness that he would secure for all of us who would believe. We thank you for his atoning work on the cross. We thank you for his substitutionary death in our place. And because of his death, Lord, we, through faith, are made holy. You have wrapped us with a robe of righteousness. You no longer see our sin, but you see your son. And Lord, we will be eternally grateful. What will it be like, Lord, seeing you for the first time? Seeing the one who bore our sins in his body on the tree 
so that we might be made righteous. Oh God, we are thankful. We are so thankful today for the gospel. Lord, may we always see you as holy. May we always see you as a God who hates our sin, who sent your son to die for our sin. May we turn from our sin. But Lord, if we are in Christ, help us to to rest, knowing that our security is found in the person of Jesus. And then not in our works, not in our efforts, not in our merit, but in Christ and Christ alone. Cause us to be grateful and help us to respond in a way that would bring you the honor and the glory that you so deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.